Hi everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. Why am I wearing gloves, you ask? Well, because I have a package and I haven't sanitized it. I just picked this up from the PO box. So today's video, we're gonna do a disk drive repair video. Let's get right to it. All right, this package was sent to me from Eric and he and I have talked, so I know what this is. You guys are probably thinking I am silly for wearing these gloves. This was handled by the Postal Service and a bunch of other people in between me and Eric. And this hasn't been sitting in my house very long, so I'm just gonna wear the gloves while I open it. I'm sure the contents inside of here are totally safe. It's just the outside of the box I wasn't sure about. So let's get these gloves off. Let's open this up. All right, so something here. Crack out for your next 80s dance party. Now, I think he meant to say 8-bit dance party, but that's okay because it's also an 80s dance party. You can kind of tell what we have here. It's a Commodore 1541-2 disk drive. And this disk drive has a fault, so we'll be working on this today. And in this yellow packaging is going to be the power supply for this disk drive. What makes the 1541-2 special, so to speak, is that it is much cooler running, and that's because Commodore moved the power supply external. This is versus a regular 1541. Glove back on to move the box. Cool, so like I said, there's an external power brick, and on the end of this cord here is a DIN connector. I don't know if this is the same as a Commodore 64. No, it's definitely not. It has five volts DC output and 12 volts DC output. So that's typical. That's what the disk drives use. I have heard from some that these power supplies aren't always the most reliable, but generally these disk drives are pretty well liked because they run really cool and they're just, their later model drives obviously and the components used inside of these is just generally pretty reliable. On the back, it's pretty standard affair. Two IEC ports, very much like any other Commodore disk drive. There are dip switches here to set the drive ID. So I think you can go eight, nine, 10, 11, maybe. Then the DC input, and we have a little power switch here. So while emailing with Eric, he sent me a video of what exactly this drive was doing. Let's check it out now. Hello, Adrian. Here is the 1541-2 drive that I told you about. This is one of two drives that I somehow destroyed by connecting them to a PC with an XE1541 cable. So any diskette, um, this is a copy of Archon that works just fine in other drives, works fine in this 1541 that has the top cover off. Load this in. And simply try and pull up a directory listing. You'll see what happens. You get a file not found error and the drive will flash like that with the drive light flashing fast. So I'm gonna pop my Mach 5 cartridge in to repeat this test. The Mach 5 will give us actual error messages from the drive and hopefully that can help. We have the Mach 5 cartridge plugged in and see what error messages that we get. Drive not ready, it will change. And read error. Okay, so Eric's video gives some really good clues as to what's not wrong with this drive. But I think I'm gonna just first start with some very basic troubleshooting on my side before we start to dig into what the problems might be. All right, so I have the drive plugged into the mains power. Let's just power this up and see what it does. So the drive light came off for a moment and shut off. So that's exactly what it was doing when Eric showed it in his video. So we know that's good. All right, next up, I think it's time to crack this open and take a quick look on the inside. Screws, what kind of screws does this have? It seems like they're small ones. There we go. Oh, they're, I'm just not doing this right. There we go. I heard that little plastic crack. That probably means that Eric has never been inside of these drives. He said that these drives were working fine and he built himself one of those XE1571 or XA1571. One of those cables lets you hook the drive up to a regular PC. 
so you can load uh, images, copy files to and from Commodore disks, back them up, stuff like that. And he said when he did that, these drives stopped working. Shelby at Tech Tangents actually just put up his video today, or is it yesterday, about using one of those cables that he made himself to copy files on and off a Commodore disk drive. And he was pretty excited about that. Uh, but those cables are really great. I do have one of those myself as well. And I've had really good success with it, um, getting files on and off, making backup copies, stuff like that. All right, opening this up, there's a lot of simplification that went on with this particular later model drive. I mean, the board is on the bottom. There's no power supply, like I mentioned. And this drive mechanism is a much more updated one. It looks a lot more like a high density disk drives that you might see on PCs, although it's missing all the drive electronics. I think we gotta get this. I've never actually taken one of these apart. So the front is held on by this lever here, which I have a feeling we just pull straight off. Oh, there we go. Oh yeah, that's got a little bit of a spring. And now the front will come off. All right, time to keep tearing it down. So there are screws here. There will be four, two on each side, and that will release the drive from the plastic. I'm using one of these magnetic mats here. I got this from AliExpress, and it's pretty nice because uh, the screws just sort of hold on to it. It's, it's weakly magnetic, and it's just excellent because you can you can just toss the screws at that and they, they don't go flying. I wish I could toss something like that at it and it would hold that too. But this is a great thing. If you are trying to keep track of screws and you don't want to accidentally drop them off the table, I recommend something like that. All right, all four screws are out. So at this point, this should just lift out and we will have to unplug these cables. First cable here is the read write head assembly. Commodore in their infinite wisdom didn't necessarily key these. So I always take a marker and I draw a line there and there, kind of part of it's on the base. And that way I know when I pull this off, now there's a blue mark on the connector on the motherboard. So I know which way that goes back on. So what's nice about these, uh, there's no drive belt because it's a direct drive motor. So from a condition perspective, this drives in pretty nice shape. It's pretty clean. And other than being dusty inside, there isn't a lot of food debris or dirt or cat or dead bugs and things like that. So I'd say Eric took pretty good care of his equipment. All right, first step is I'm just gonna pull this PCB out of the case. It's so small. Let's move that away. Okay, so first thing I wanna check are the voltages. So right now the drive is connected, at least these two connectors to the main PCB. Power supply is connected. The read write heads are not connected. They're over on the side, the cable doesn't really reach, but that's fine. This will work fine without it. And I'm gonna power this up now the drive spins, I hear the spinning, and I got the multimeter here. And let's first of all check the five volt power rail. So this is a little bypass cap. Here's the ground rail, and this here must be five volts, 5.01, so that's fine. So no issues there. There we are, 12.1 volts on the 12 volt rail. So that looks good. Okay, so we're ruled out that the DC power supply is the fault. You never know when you have unpredictable behavior could well be the five volt power rail. So the next thing I wanna do before we test this on a real 64 is check that the heads are dirty or clean. So the heads are right underneath this little pad. The head is only on the bottom side. So here is the reed head. And if I lift this up, see this white thing under there that has the black line on it? That is the actual reed head. It always reads from the underside of the disc when you have a single sided drive like this. Well, the black line is normal, but you see all this crud that's on there? That's not normal. Eric had had these drives since they were new and they probably got used a lot. And that might be the problem right there, that black crud that's on there. Cleaning a head is not too difficult to use a cotton swab and I have some 99% isopropyl alcohol in here. I'm just gonna spray this on the table and wipe up some of it onto this cotton swab. And we very gently lift this little cover thing and I'm just gonna clean that crud right off of there. Oh, that is stubborn. Wow, that is not coming off very easily. I'm gonna try scraping it a little bit with this uh, tool here. You don't wanna scratch the head, right? Gonna clean it with the 
cotton swab a bit more. It's really stubborn, but I can feel it. It's definitely on the surface of the head. I have to say, I've never worked on a disk drive where it was so stuck on. <sighs> All right, you know what? You know what took this right off? Look at that. It's totally clean now. Windex. I took a tiny bit of Windex and I dabbed this little tool in there. And as soon as I rubbed it, it came right off. And now I'm just using some isopropyl alcohol on the head just to do the final clean. But that, that is how it should look. A black line, a white head, and a little dot in the center, and that's it. All right, so I need to hook this up again. I'm gonna do it outside the case, but the read-write cable doesn't reach because there's a little cable retainer here that's bent down to hold that in place. Same right here. I'm just gonna bend these out like that. So that freed up this excess length on the cable. And we can run this cable to there. Trying to figure out the best way to orient this so I can have it sit on the table with the drive connected, just like that. So now the read right head is connected and there's enough slack so the head can move and these two connectors are connected. Okay, we have the ZIF 64. I have the Easy Flash 3 cartridge in there. I'm gonna use one of my discs. This is SidBurner 7 because I know this is a good disc. Pop this in and we're gonna lower this down. Oh boy, you need the lever <laughs> without this on there. It's kind of impossible. So we'll just slide that on, there we go. Okay, disc is in. Let's give this a try. And I apologize, I don't know the wedge commands to load that, so I'm gonna type it. Oh, look at that, it didn't even work. Oh, um, yeah, it would help if the disc drive were turned on. Maybe now it'll work. Uh, that's kind of ridiculous. Let's try that again. Okay, well that loaded very quickly, so that's kind of cool. Let's do run, and now this is gonna take over. So we have the music. Okay, so it absolutely loaded this floppy disk without an issue, no problems. Okay, so that worked perfectly. Now, let's see, that doesn't mean that there's not still a potential fault on this drive. Let's go to Adrian's tools, and I have on here the 1541 diagnostic cartridge there is a performance test. And what that does is it puts the drive through all of its paces. So you need to take a known good disc, which is this right here, and we're gonna stick this in. It will be a destructive test. So don't put something in there that's got important files on there because it will erase it. And we hit P for performance test, and it says press return. And now it's formatting the disc, and here it goes. What happens as it runs through the tests, you see various status messages. So formatting was okay, mechanical test okay, open file for writing, and now it's gonna run through a whole bunch of tests. Well, the tests all passed with flying colors. So this drive seems to be perfect, no more faults. So Eric, thanks for sending me this drive. I know it seemed coincidental that when you tried to use those cables on your drives, they stopped working, but it appears that the heads are just dirty and it was really crusty. So it's quite possible that some of your floppy disks that you were trying to read have oxidized and decayed. And as you read them, it scraped off the disk uh, magnetic surface and it ended up on the heads, rendering the drive unable to read anything. So your other 1541-2 drive probably has exactly the same situation. So you're gonna need to open it up and clean the heads, just like you saw here. All right, so what I'm gonna do next is lubricate these rails here. So the first of all, there's a little bit of dust here. So I'm just gonna use some compressed air and just, and shoot that out of there. So the, what happens is the head assembly is this black plastic part. It rides on these silver rods here, back and forth. And these can get just a little bit gummed up over time. So again, I like to take a cotton swab that's got some IPA and just, sort of clean them up, and then we're gonna lubricate them. All right, and I'm gonna use a little bit of silicone here. This is a liquid lubricant, it's long lasting. So I just put a little bit on the cotton swab, and then I just put that all over these rails. And you just make sure you don't wanna get this on top of the heads that we just cleaned. Put it all over the rails, on the tops and the bottoms. And then as you move the head back and forth, it's already moving a lot smoother than it was. 
Also what I have is a little bit of silicone grease here. And I am just gonna put a little dab of this right here on this metal thing. So the little thing here that pushes down the disc, this rides on this metal rod here that when you lower the drive mechanism, it does go down. So this is actually pushing on the disc. But when it's up and the head moves back and forth, it does slide on this metal here. So I just like to put a little bit of the silicone on here. Just like that, just a small amount. And then when we move this, now it's wiping it back and forth. And if there's a little bit of extra, you just take it off with the, with the cotton swab. And now that will just slide a little more smoothly on there. It's probably not necessary. I don't think it ever had any on originally. Now this moves nice and smoothly. That's what's important. Some of this stuff here moves when you put the discs in. This is what kind of helps eject the disc when you open the lever. If this stuff is not moving super smooth, and it is a little rough feeling, I'm just gonna add a couple drops of the silicone underneath here. Just a little bit. You don't want to put too much because you don't want this stuff like dripping down onto the discs. Okay, that's, that is moving a lot more smoothly now. now. This spot right here as well, looks like it has a little bit of some kind of lithium grease on there. I have some white lithium grease right here. So I'll probably just put a little dab of that. And then I'll use a cotton swab just to, I put way too much actually. Just gonna put a little bit on there like that. Clean off this ridiculous excess I put on here. All right, so the drive is nicely lubricated. It is ready to be assembled. All I need to do is fix this drive cable here, which if you remember was tucked into this little strain relief here. So that goes in to a little slot right there. And then it was underneath this little cable holder right there. And what I need to do is just bend these down. And this one was bent around the cable as well. Just like that. So that is not gonna move anymore. This is to hold this drive cable. So as the head moves back and forth, that it won't pull this out. So just make sure the head can move fully through the entire range of operation without any issue. And we just put this top cover on, kind of hinge that on the top, that hooks on the front faceplate. And there we go, the drive is assembled. We just have to put the four screws in the bottom. And there we are, one 2 that looks pretty much as good as new. It's hard to believe this thing is as old as it is. So now the 1541 2 is working perfectly. Let's do some more testing of fast loading to see which is the fastest. Since the last video where I showed various fast loaders, I've done some work on my Easy Flash 3 cartridge, and I've loaded the Action Replay 5 NTSC cartridge onto here, along with Super Snapshot 5.2, and the final cartridge three. All of these have fast loader capabilities and the action replay actually has two different types of fast loaders. So let's check out to see how fast these actually are. So to make this testing comparable to the last one, I'm gonna be using the Commodore 64 game portal once again. And as a refresher, these are the times that we got on the last video. One minute, 26 seconds for stock, 17 seconds for Jiffy DOS. The Epic's fast loader resulted in around 37 seconds. Warp Speed 2.0 gave an incredible 12 seconds, and Mach 5 V1B gave 36 seconds. So the winner obviously was Warp Speed 2.0 on the last round, but a lot of people commented that these other fast loaders are very fast and could possibly beat these. So let's test that out. So back in the 80s and the 90s, Action Replay was a pretty popular cartridge or piece of software for your computer or your game console that allowed you to kind of hack games. You could freeze a game while you were playing it and do things like give yourselves unlimited lives, also change your score, give yourselves power up, stuff like that. There was a whole community behind this. But on the Commodore 64 specifically, it did allow these types of functions, but you could also save games while you were playing them. So if you had a tape game, you could potentially convert it to disc. But the biggest thing that we're gonna be using is the fast loader here. So this is what you would get when you booted up your Commodore 64 when you had Action Replay installed. Oh, one thing also, in NTSC regions, Action Replay only ever went up to version five. So that's the version I'm going to be using. 
So if we hit F7 for the fast loader, it drops us into basic and says fast load V5. And we can type the dollar sign, which will give us a directory of what's on the floppy disk. This was a fresh floppy disk and I copied portal onto it. But you'll also notice something portal warp. I'll get to that in a second. So as many people pointed out in my last video, a lot of these fast loaders come with a DOS wedge. And what that does is it adds additional commands to the Commodore 64, like dollar sign to do a directory listing to simplify disk operations. Now, unfortunately, these commands aren't universal and aren't the same from one fast loader to another. So without me checking the manuals, it's not going to be something I'm going to know how to do. But dollar sign seems to be a pretty common one for at least doing a directory. And another common one is pushing the up arrow to load a program. So let's load portal and this should load and run the game. And I'm going to hit enter and the start button on the clock at the same time. And here we go. Okay, 6.9, so seven seconds. Also, some people had to point out in my last video that I didn't run the game. So they were like, was it even working? But I had off camera run the game on all of the fast loaders that I had tested. So it did work. And with this game, you hit space and that will essentially do this little decompression. And there's the game running. All right, so we got seven seconds, which is really good. So let's just quickly switch back to this. And let me just put seven seconds on here for the time, which is amazing. All right, next up, we're gonna be testing the warp functionality of the action replay. If I go to the main menu and I hit F5 for utilities, there's a disk copy function here and I hit A. This allows you to copy files from one disk to another. You can say copy from disk nine to eight, but if you set warp save to yes, what happens is any files that are copied are saved in a format on the destination disk that only the action replay can load, but it's able to load them even faster than the standard copy, which is what we just did at seven seconds. So that second portal copy there is a warp version that I use this utility to make, and that should result in even faster loading times. There are two things to note. The extension or whatever the type is this weird L dollar sign bracket as opposed to PRG, and the size is also larger. It takes a little bit more space on disk, but I guess that's the trade-off if you wanna get this faster speed. Okay, we're ready to go. I have the up arrow, portal warp, I will hit enter and start at the same time. And here we go. So 5.5 seconds, and I was a little slow on the stop. I also noticed the drive had to seek a little bit before it could read the program, and that's because that file is stored second on the disk after that first one. So if I had put it as the first file on the disk, I bet it would have loaded even more quickly probably in less than five seconds. So I'm gonna call that five seconds. Sorry for my scribbly writing. That is mighty, mighty impressive. All right, the final cartridge we're gonna do is Final Cart 3. It's funny, Final Cartridge is Final Cartridge 3. You hit L. This is an interesting one. It gives you this little desktop environment with a mouse pointer, use the F keys or a mouse, but I don't have a mouse hooked up to move around. So yeah, it gives you a little bit of a final cartridge three. I think the version I'm running is from 1988, even though it has 87 here. You have all sorts of menu items you can pick from, a notepad, but we're just gonna drop into basic here, which should give us a standard basic, but with a fast loader and a DOS wedge. Okay, I figured out that the F5 key is the equivalent of the load with a star. And I'm gonna hit that and start at the same time. Here we go. The game has completed loading. If we just type run, we just test that out. There it is, working fine. And the time we got was a little over 10 seconds. So I'm gonna call that 10 seconds even. Well, everyone, there we have it. From one minute, 26 seconds on a stock disk drive, stock Commodore 64, all the way down to five seconds to load the same program with Action Replay 5 Warp. I'm gonna to have to call it and say that at least it seems like Action Replay 5 is by far the fastest fast loader of all, at least with this particular program, your mileage may vary. I would say that Jiffy DOS is probably the most useful overall though, because the fact that the disk drive and the Commodore 64 both have a Jiffy DOS ROM, it means it's more likely to work in more situations 
And also people did let me know that with these other fast loaders, it takes up a little bit of the RAM inside of the disk drive, which can cause some programs not to run properly. Jiffy DOS, because it's in ROM on the disk drive, doesn't have that side effect. And almost always a disk drive is fully compatible with all software while Jiffy DOS is enabled. But most people just install a little toggle switch on the back of their drive, which will disable Jiffy DOS if you really need to go back to completely bone stock. Before we end this video, there's one more thing to do. I have crack out for your next 80s dance party from Eric. Let's test this disk out. Why don't we use Action Replay 5 while we're at it, but we'll test it out on his disk drive. Mm, yes, there it is, crack out. Okay, so we're gonna hit the up arrow and we're gonna do crack out. Turn the volume up a little bit on the TV. The SID in this machine has a little bit of a problem. So it has a, a bit of a high pitched sound. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> this is sort of an Arcanoid, an Arcanoid clone, but a sideways one. I have to say, I've never actually played this before. Nice. It's quite good, actually. This is uh, from the 80s, huh? Oh, it shrunk me. I don't want that. It's interesting how those little pill things don't fall towards you like they do in Arkanoid. You have to hit them with the ball, plus there's those little robots and look at that, a head. Oh, oops. All right, that's gonna be it for this video. A little bit of a repair, a little bit of a fast loader comparison, a little bit of crack out. Thanks, Eric, for sending me this disk drive. Hopefully you can fix your other one if it has the exact same fault with a dirty head. And I thought it was very interesting to find out that Action Replay 5 really is the fastest fast loader. Well, that's probably gonna create some controversy. So put your comments in the comment section below. Let me know what you think about which is the best fast loader. If you like this video, you can hit that thumbs up button. But if you didn't, you know what to do, hit that thumbs down. If you haven't already, I'd love it if you subscribe to my channel and hit that little bell icon next to the subscribe button if you wanna be notified about new videos. Thank you very much for watching. Stay safe and stay healthy. Goodbye.